Um, so the uh, talk is about shifting left and right. Who's familiar with the term shifting left and shifting right? Yep, okay, so maybe. Basically, how do dev and data teams work together better is the essence of the talk. So who am I? I wrote um, Fundamentals of Data Engineering. It's this book here on O'Reilly. From what I heard, it's one of the best-selling books, if not the best-selling book right now. On O'Reilly, it's about data engineering, surprisingly enough. So um, if, who won the book, by the way, just a second ago? A couple people? Cool. Uh, hit me up. I'll sign it for you. So. Um, and I do have some uh, copies I'll sign as well for people who participate. This will be a very uh, participatory uh, discussion here, so I'm going to ask uh, the audience actually a lot of questions. Um, so anyway, about me, wrote a book. I'm a recovering data scientist and a data engineer. Uh, you can ask me what a recovering data scientist is. Um, these days, I, I go around the, uh, the world giving talks, um, so, uh, and I consult and advise companies as well. I also have podcasts, I'm working on another book. Um, my spare time, I rock climb, troll run around uh, Salt Lake City, so anyway, it's a lot of fun. So, Who had heard of the fundamentals of data engineering, by the way? Show of hands. Handful of people, great. Well, now you've all heard about it, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, so what you'll learn, I mean, there's kind of two big themes I've been noticing. Um, you know, when I was asked to do this talk, I wanted to make it really relevant to uh, developers and, and uh, people in DevOps. I, I imagine that's the audience here, so. Um, but really what I'm, so what I'm seeing is a tale of two worlds, or, or silos maybe. And then, um, you know, basically the notion is how can dev and data work together? So, and improve collaboration. I guess, why should you care? <clears throat> well, there is a real gap um, you know, between dev and data, yet data is everywhere, it's growing. How many of you work at companies where um, there's something going on with, uh, quote, data? Everyone? Okay. <laughs> How many of you care? Not that many, actually. Okay. Herein lies part of the problem. Well, we'll talk about this. <laughs> so, um, but there's, there's this old trope that uh, every company is a data company. I, I do believe this, um, and I'll get more into why this is in a bit, but basically every application is becoming a, quote, data application. If you think about companies like Uber, for example, Uber is essentially a data application. It takes large amounts of data <laughs> to be able to do what Uber does, right? You couldn't do this on a, uh, a SQLite database, for example. That'd be kind of odd. Um, it takes large amounts of data for stuff like Uber and Lyft to um, you know, be able to make a, you know, Pricing, writer matching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can make a very strong argument that most apps are becoming like this. Um, at some point, every app will become like this. Um, who's heard of the rise of, uh, who's heard of chat GPT? Everybody, right, data powered, right? So data's everywhere. Um, at the same time, I feel like we're stuck in the 1980s when it comes to how data and dev teams work together. Um, the sense there's just a uh, very strong kind of a, um, you know, wall between the two. And um, this has to change, right? So. Uh, again, every app is a data app. Um, data and dev teams need to work together. So <clears throat> let's go into a tale of two worlds real quick. Um, what I see, again, is, is a giant divide. I mean, I, I travel the world a lot. I mean, it, it, pretty much every other week I'm somewhere on the planet. So I think I have a pretty good perspective about, um, you know, what's going on uh, with teams. And it's pretty shocking, actually, how common this is. It, it's like... Uh, I don't know, it's like a disease or something, or, or it's just human behavior. It is what it is. Um, yeah, no matter where I go in the, in the world, it seems to be that um, dev and data teams don't work together. And I feel like right now, which I'll get into, um, it's very lopsided in favor of the uh, dev teams. Um, there's no empathy for each other's roles. Um, I guess just show, kind of show of hands here, who, who understands what your stakeholders, do you understand what your stakeholders do? Do you know who your stakeholders are? Show of hands. Okay, for that, that's interesting. About like less than half the room knew who their stakeholders are. Hmm. That's, uh, that's interesting in and of itself. Um, so anyway, you know, lack of empathy uh, means that there's going to be a little, very little collaboration. I would say that an increase in animosity as well. Um, you know, so who's heard of? Um, uh, <coughs> This term. <laughs> yeah? So right now, this is sort of the intersection of, of or the interaction, I suppose, of how dev and data teams work. Um, it's basically dev on the left here, throwing things over to the data teams. Data teams get to deal with it, and you can kind of imagine what happens. Does this sound familiar to you? Uh, where you work at? Show of hands, so I can't really see head nods that well. Okay. 
Um, I guess to ask you all, are there any other um, situations in your work where um, uh, stuff flows downhill? Anyone want to give some examples or an example? Yeah? Security. Security? Tell me more. Can somebody get over a mic as well? Oh, thank you. Wait, who was that? Uh, the one raising the hand right there. Thanks. So I have a very similar uh, perspective from yep. a data perspective. Interesting. Uh, when it, or the ops perspective when it comes to security, because oftentimes dev teams hate security more than really any other group uh, inside a company. And so oftentimes dev teams trying to meet their deadline, their cost, or feature deployments will just shift security to that right. Oh, and wow lets whatever comes out of that flow downhill and security on the right is left picking up all the pieces that come from dev activities. Interesting. We'll talk about this more in a bit. <laughs> so, uh, who else has experienced uh, security sort of being downhill from dev in that manner? Nobody else? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Probably don't want to talk about it. That's, I, I, it's, a, it's a safe place. You can you can you can talk about these things. So, but no, this <clears throat> this happens a lot, right? So, and, and this manifests itself in the form of a lot of things, which I'll get into. But, but again, this, this is extremely common. I would say, um, you know, it's like a lot of jobs, really, right? You're on the receiving end of a lot of stuff from, uh, you know, uh, the uphill uh, <laughs> stakeholder, and that's kind of how it is right now. And what this does is, you know. These are a few things I've seen, data teams, right? So an upstream dependency is uh, broken, right? This could be a database, could be um, you know, something that data teams need to access. Who, who understands what, a data, what people on data teams do? Maybe I should explain that real quick. So you know, people on data teams, they t you know, they're responsible for things like analysis, data science, machine learning, all this stuff, right? But they need to get data from source systems. These are typically applications. Uh, applications. Um, you know, typically provide data in the form of uh, databases, sometimes files, sometimes file systems, object storage, et cetera, et cetera. But really, uh, these are the dependencies upon which a data team, um, you know, relies upon. And when these are down, the data team can't do its job. So another example, a database schema change. Uh, how many people deal with schema changes in databases, right? Um, how many people are, are aware of when schema changes happen? in their jobs, or how many people find out after the fact? Okay, I think there's a silent majority here that doesn't want to say anything. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, and, and how do you think this impacts data teams? When a, when a schema changes and a data team isn't aware of it, how do you, how do you think this hap uh, goes down? Anyone want to take a guess? Integrations are broken, yeah, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, integrations are broken. What it means is, um, yeah, data pipelines, um, they break. Uh, data is broken now. Um, a lot of things are broken, right? So, and effectively it means that the, that loop, you know, the, uh, the um, stuff flows downhill, that, that just happened too. So, um, you know, so that sucks. And then these people can't do their job and they're trying to get, you know, they try and go back to the dev team and the dev team's like, yeah, I mean, I made a change. You get to deal with it. This is typically what happens right now is, oh, it's the data team's fault, you know, blame the victim. So this is your problem, uh, you get to deal with it, have a nice day. So another thing I notice is uh, there's no common vocabulary for definitions or meaning about the data of, that they receive from dev. So I'll give you some examples. In your companies that you work at, maybe, um, who here has a, who works at a company that has customers? Everybody? Um, if I were to ask you what a customer is, let me just, let me just randomly pick on a section of people over here. Um, somebody, can somebody answer what they think a customer is? Yes, you, and the black there. Somebody who costs money to come to your business. Okay. That is it. It is not your other teams. It is not uh, some other entities. They cause money to come to your business. Hmm. That's customer. How long does a customer have to be around? 
Okay. So this is, this is an interesting one. Uh, customer is, is a definition where um, either there's a good definition like what you provided, where it's very clear somebody gives us money. As long as they're around giving us money, they're a customer. What was really interesting is uh, I've seen several companies that uh, <laughs> you ask um, the C-levels, what's a customer? And it takes three weeks to get the answer that, oh, we have about five different definitions for a customer, actually. So it could be somebody that paid us in 90 days. It could be somebody that brought from us ever, you know, or some variation in between. It could be somebody who has an account and never actually bought anything. That's also a customer for some reason. I don't know why. So, <clears throat> but typically, again, things flow downhill from dev to data, and so you're, you know, data has to rely upon the, um, you know, the data sets that they get from dev. And typically, what happens is the, uh, if they don't understand what the, um, you say, a fields in a, you know, a database mean, then. It's kind of like, now it's left up to interpretation. Typically what I find though is, dev sometimes doesn't even know what these uh, fields mean. They just make apps and they keep adding more fields in or, or whatever, but there's no uh, standard definition even on the dev team of say customer, product, um, certain types of prices for example, or whatever fields you want to add to it, right? Who's seen this before? I see people nodding their heads and raising, yeah. and so. You know, and, and, and I would say, especially in, in development, it, it's, it was some frameworks, you know, some web frameworks and app frameworks. It's super easy to keep adding fields to a database. And I, can, I think you can imagine what happens. It's like you keep getting um, more and more, uh, you know, variations of fields, and this creates more and more confusion and, uh, and so forth. So it's a big problem. Um, let's see. I've seen dev teams experience um, requests from the data team to change the, uh, the app database, right? And so this right now is seen as kind of more of an annoyance than anything. So it's like, well, I got to do my job. Like, why don't you guys figure it out? And it's like, yeah, but I depended upon you to get the data. So I don't know, how am I supposed to figure this out? And it's the real thing though. It happens all the time. It creates huge bottlenecks for data teams. Dev, I think, is moving at a much faster pace. Data teams can only move at the pace um, that they can. And so, um, if changes happen, this, this creates um, you know, a lot of issues for data teams. Um, you know, again, kind of downstream though, new data workflows are introduced um, back into the application. So who's had to work with uh, machine learning here? Anybody? Handful of people? Right, so increasingly what, what, what I've been seeing is machine learning workflows are going back into the application. Right, so this means getting predictions, um, you know, and, and the app has to use these predictions um, you know, in order to um, you know, provide you know, different experiences for the app and so forth. Has anyone had to deal with this yet or anything on the roadmap for that? Yeah, so um, yeah, it's, it's, it's coming. So uh, there's also something called reverse ETL. Has anyone heard about that? Yeah, it's taking data from you know, a data warehouse and actually piping it back into a, the source transactional system. This is increasingly becoming a, uh, a very common workflow as well. So what this means is now it's not a one-way street, actually. It's, it's more of a kind of a feedback loop. So the data that the dev provides to, uh, you know, to the data team is now going back to data, or the dev team. So you can imagine this is sort of like uh, the equivalent of like, you know, taking a photocopier, if anyone remembers what those are, and then photocopying the same page over and over and over again, and getting uh, increasingly a lower fidelity on it. This is similar to what happens with data, right? That comes from a source system, something happens to it, then it goes back to the source system, you're like, I don't know what this is. Um, and now devs are starting to care that I've seen, because now they're saying, okay, so <laughs> uh, if the data I've been providing is coming back in sort of this weird Rube, Goldberg, ruled, uh, Rube Goldbergian type of workflow, or um, you know, it looks a bit different, um, but I have to use this as an input now to my app that I'm now giving you as an output again. Sort of, uh, circular reasoning gets a bit uh, interesting in this one. Um, and I think also dev teams experience animosity from the data team that nothing seems to work, right? They're always on the receiving end of a bunch of crap, just like security was in that other example there. So again, it's, um, it seems like a very much a one-way street right now, but I would like to open this up to the audience um, and, uh, and ask you, what, what are you observing, you know, data or otherwise, just in terms of maybe, you know, kind of, uh, you know, this happening in, in your jobs. So, anybody want to, uh, any, any observations whatsoever? Yeah, uh, the person in the yellow over there. You want to raise your hand again?
What's interesting is, as data engineers, we're really enjoying the fact of being dumped on by dev teams. And uh, that's entertaining, kinda, but it doesn't create a collaborative environment. As security teams, we enjoy also getting dumped on by dev teams. As ops teams, you know, hey, can you stand this up quick so I can deploy that thing? I would argue that the same is true of dev teams. Business users, uh, usually non-technical business users, come to us with requirements and say, make it work in my deadline. And by the way, you can't have overtime. But do it anyway. And so dev teams get dumped on too. Mm. It's not unique to the data team to be downstream from awful. Yep. But it is unique that we like to be victims in technology. So how about instead of being victims, we take ownership of our destiny. Let's get earlier into the conversation. Let's collaborate earlier. That's kind of what the DevOps movement is. Let's create this agile-like environment where we get all the stakeholders, all the business cases, all of the users together in a spot where we can build out those data definitions, where we can create the ETL processes in paper, and find the spots where they don't work. Then let's go build the system. At that point, now we're collaborating. Now we've got this cooperative environment, and we're not, you know, blaming him for not doing my job. Yep. I like that. What we, actually, a question for you. What are some things that you've seen that, that improves collaboration? This will get to my second point in the uh, conversation, but I'm very curious. Uh, since you're what I found really helps collaboration is empathy, but also starting early. You know, if we can include you in the conversation as we design it, then you feel empowered to facilitate the design, you feel empowered to make change in the system, and you feel like your voice is heard. At the end of the day, you know, our job is to deliver value to users, and so all of us are kind of beholden to that goal. Yep. So at the end of the day, uh, yeah, we all need to compromise. I'm not throwing it over the wall to you, you're not throwing it over the wall to me, but rather we collaboratively understand the goals of our users. Right. Well, thank you. Hand up back there. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that sentiment of like, um, what I see a lot of times is um, at, in all disciplines, ops, data, dev, uh, we, I, we have this concept of throwing it over the wall, as you just mentioned, and also the concept of other teams, customer. But I think this is like just a fundamental flaw in our reasoning about how we think about digital systems because, and how we organize those teams around those digital systems because we're not data engineers, we're not dev developers, we're not ops engineers, we're people, we're engineers that are on a team to create value for a customer. So there are no walls, there are only uh, objectives and we're all sort of um, beholden to the goal, not um, our particular discipline and I think that's where as IT people, whatever you want to say, we need to kind of change our mindset a little bit about what our job is. Because our job is not to build APIs, is not to manipulate data. Our job is to create value for the people that provide us money, our customers. So I think like, and this happens at the top as well, but we, we need to, I think as a uh, community, we need to sort of change our perspectives about how we think about teams and organizations and what our job is day to day. Uh, way over here, I'm gonna make you uh, get a good workout, uh, get your steps in. Um, oh, perfect, Never mind. <laughs> Thank you. I think it also has to do with size of a team, size of a company. <clears throat> so I, I came from a startup where uh, we were very, we worked very well with the data team, and um, <clears throat> we let them know when the schema changes. They let us know that they have a higher level view of our, of our data, so they have let us know, hey, something's going wrong here. And there was a lot of back and forth um, helping each other out. Yeah, that's cool. Any other observations? There's somebody back here. Um, I think also expanding the definition of customer to anyone that's consuming the stuff that you're working on. So if you're in a development team and the data teams are going to be consuming the changes that you're producing and you're thinking about them as you're making those changes, I, I think like someone else mentioned, like reach out to them and try, try to collaborate with them. Um, the advantage of those internal customers, quote unquote, is that it's very easy to get a hold of them. Like you can just ping them on Slack or whatever you use internally. 
Yeah, good thoughts here, and we'll, we'll come back to the notion of collaboration in a bit. Again, it's, it's, it's shocking that this is, um, <laughs> this shouldn't be anything new, right? I mean, who, think, who, who thinks this is new news, that there's, there's silos and walls and all this stuff? Just show of hands here. No? Okay. Why is it <laughs> that, you know, in 2023, I mean, when, you know, we're still talking about this. And we're still afflicted by this. It, it amazes me. And anywhere in the world I go, um, which is a lot of places these days, um, this is the same conversation I keep having over and over again. So I'm not hallucinating on this. And this is something that, um, I, you know, it's, um, I'd like to think we've figured it out by now, but obviously we haven't. So uh, collaboration, let's talk about that. And again, I, I agree with the sentiments of, of the, uh, of, you know, the people who, um, you know, gave some comments here that, uh, collaboration is very key. Uh, it's it's everything, and it, it's just that easy to say, and, it, and, it, and apparently it's just that hard to do, right? So um, I wish I had a silver bullet to this. Uh, you know, we, we wouldn't have to have this talk. We could talk about really cool stuff, but here we are. Um, so you know, so again, the, the notion is really shifting left and right. You know, and I and I and I do agree that this isn't just a data team specific thing. Could be sec, you know, could be uh, dev, ops, could be anything. I, I come from the world of data, so I think in, in terms of the, uh, the world of data, um, you may not um, plug in whatever you want for data, and that's, that's your world. Um, you know, but this is what it is, right? I think I've even seen, I've even seen the same thing with uh, sales and marketing, to be frank. Who else has seen this with sales and marketing? Where it's like, a, you know, salespeople hate marketing's guts and vice versa. You know, I mean, so this is very, very. Uh, um, <clears throat> very common thing here. So, I, I, I mean, let me dive into this a bit more. I mean, improving collaboration. I mean, you know, I, I would like to think we're all, um, you know, solution oriented here. Um, you know, we've heard a few ideas in collaboration. I want maybe I'll change this and ask, why? Why do you think walls exist in the first place? Anyone want to try and tackle that one or address there's somebody right up over here? Or were you just were you raising your hand or? I think it has a lot to do with like knowledge transfer between teams. Not a lot of teams have like a lot of documentation or proper documentation on what they do. So it's really hard to collaborate if you don't understand what the other team is doing or working mm. on. Interesting. The, uh, okay. <laughs> Bunch of people. Uh, people tend to do uh, what they're uh, incentivized to do, whether that's implicitly or explicitly. Uh, back in my, uh, uh, I had a seven year stint uh, making video games for Disney and one of the story, uh, one of the story uh, guys explained to me that believable characters in a story, uh, they always take the, the shortest path to success. And if you try and write a character that takes the long way around on, on purpose, it's just not believable for people. And you know, in, in our companies, we tend to report to people who, uh, you know, they've got a, a limited view of what success looks like. And so mm -hmm. oftentimes you're, you are incentivized to, to just take on the cares of who you report to. Mm -hmm. And if that isn't, if they're not playing the long game, if they're playing the short game, then you're, you know, you're going to end up uh, in lots of silos. That's really true. Who knows who Charlie Munger is? He's a, uh, who's heard of Warren Buffett? Okay. So Warren Buffett, he, he's, he's done okay in his day. Um, his, his business partner's name is Charlie Munger, and he's got a really good quote. My, probably my fav favorite quote, I think, related to what you said. It's a, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. So, I'll let this sink in for a bit. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think somebody over here had their hand up. Did the guy in the middle there in the black shirt actually had his hand up? This reminds me of the, an old end back test uh, you had to do. I guess to I guess piggyback on that point, I imagine that this happens because you're well, one the incentives. You have an objective on each team that seems pretty straightforward and collaboration is secondary to that objective. 
And oftentimes you're trying to move quickly and accomplish your goals and anything secondary to that is perceived as additional red tape. Mm. And maybe you know you can deal with it after the fact and you know, generate tech debt that the other team, if you can kind of punt it to them, I think that's the prevailing sentiment. Mm. Let's take care of our, you know, our team first and then we can deal with the repercussions later. That's a good point. Who else has seen this in their, uh, where they work? Two people? So you all work in like really collaborative places. I should ask that as, as, as actually as a very honest question. Who feels like they work in a collaborative work environment? Strangely, it's the side of the room. I don't understand why. Um, do y'all work at the same company? Y'all, y'all do. Okay. So you all work. At, you all collaborate. That's cool. And then these nobody. You all work for each, yourselves or something. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's interesting. Um, so there's one hand out back up over there, and then I'll get to you. And then... So I think once, once people are in large enough groups, you have to sort of segment them in order to be able to work together, right? So, so what organizations tend to do is create demarcations where they say, okay, this is, this is where you're done and the other team starts. And so it's, it's the agreement on that interface and then just because of primitive parts of our brain and in-group, out-group thinking and stuff like that, we start saying, okay, well, if it's, if it's ours, we take care of it. If it's yours, you take care of it and we don't really care what you do to take care of your stuff. That's a really good point. Who's heard of Conway's Law? Show of hands. Who, who wants me to explain it real quick? Great. <laughs> Conway's law describes um, basically that organizations will design um, ways of communicating in order, uh, the, in, um, you'll design systems uh, according to the way that your organization communicates. So does that make sense? So if you have a really siloed organization that's demarcated uh, according to how he described it, the demarcation lines is basically how you're going to define your systems. Um, and hence how you'll work as an organization. Um, there's a really good book called Team Topologies, um, if anyone's heard of that. Uh, that describes basically um, ways of, of um, maybe redesigning uh, you know, uh, software teams and so forth uh, to better capitalize on uh, Conway's Law. And it actually has an interesting thing called reverse Conway's Law, which means you, you um, typically, in Conway's Law, you're designing an architecture to fit the organization. Um, um, in a reverse Conway's law, what it means is you're, you're designing your team to fit the architecture that you want. So you're actually working backwards or reverse, I guess. But, um, so it's an interesting way to, to maybe solve the problem. I've, I've actually never seen it um, in practice, but that's not to say it hasn't worked. People have written about success stories and so forth doing that. So um, any other um, ideas on how to improve collaboration? We'll maybe take a couple more points here. There's one person here in, in the back. I'm going to speak from my uh, very particular uh, perspective because I'm a Scrum Master. So the very first thing that I would do is um, help them to get to know each other. Because if there is no connectedness, there is no way, somebody already mentioned empathy, so there is no way that I will want to collaborate, which is the very first step, right? You need to want to collaborate. And how do you do that? Well, you get to know each other, uh, even if from, uh, from different teams. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going to team building, and after you get that connectedness, you start with uh, T-shaping, and then you start breaking down barriers, you know, silos and all that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how we've done it. It's really cool. Awesome. And, uh... <clears throat> I'm just going off of um, a lot of the systems-based thinking that we're talking about. And one of the things that I'd mention is, going back to the incentivization, is are we incentivizing competition? Are we incentivizing individuality? Or are we incentivizing team-based collaboration? And if you're incentivizing collaboration and rewarding that, um, then usually you can get that outcome. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Thank you. Um, one over there, then one over there, then there was one person in the back there. Actually, I think the person in the back had his hand up first uh, before everybody, so we'll go to him and then you two, then we'll carry on. So thank you. Yeah, I think one of the uh, problems we have too is the way that organizations are structured. Um, 
I'm a big proponent of OKRs, <clears throat> and so if management is not really promoting and di communicating down what the goals are for the whole organization or you know, division or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and then outlining those with their um, outcomes as they're expecting that with the measures on it, and they're not communicating that out, then everybody's kind of off doing they're like they're saying, I've got this goal for me over here and higher, but we're not working towards the same goal. But if we have that, and then and those are broken down, and those are incentivized that we all working together to the same goal, I think that's gonna help communication because we're all gonna be working towards the same thing. Right now, I think we've got too many teams and people are working for their own things instead of working for the common thing that's coming from upper management, but upper management and the CEOs need to know that and set that organization up that way and communicate that information down. That's a really good point. Thank you. So I work for a security company um, that is based all over the world. And there's a lot of different teams that uh, I end up supporting with my build and automation team. And it's a very grassroots kind of uh, development. Uh, we're trying to um, influence uh, engineering productivity by giving them better tools and better processes. Um, so it, I don't really have a directive top down to do this, but mid-level management sees the value in what we're trying to do. Um, so I don't really have a way to not force collaboration. I have to incentivize it. Um, and the way that I do that is by uh, advocating DevOps uh, processes and tools to everyone around us. We hold a, a weekly sync up meeting and we just invite people who are inclined to like the processes of what we're doing. Uh, there's no um, directive that people have to come or that they need to send a representative. We've got people from QA, from cloud ops, from development, uh, all the different dev teams, and they all come because they want to, because they are starting to see the value in the collaboration. So uh, you really get um, uh, traction with this type of uh, um, uh, effort when people see the, the fruits of their, the labors, so to speak. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, it's cool. It sounds like people just show up because they want to. It's awesome. Um, I think take these two over here, then we'll, we'll move on. So. Yeah, at the startup I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> my first week there, or first two weeks there, I spent time meeting with people from all the different organizations, from customer service, from fulfillment, the, the warehouse even. Um, and it, it helped me get a perspective of where, how I fit in the beer picture and also get empathy for the things they, they, they did. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, I wanted to mention, like, I actually, on the side of guys who are actually talking about collaboration, but I came from like a short environment and like where there is a customer who is like godlike and people like who are doing development is not often understand what, what does that mean. And if like someone trying to like buy a couple of teams like for doing let's say development slash DevOps slash whatever things, other things has to be done and it, it's not, came by itself this understanding of came to to team so someone in team who should go and like take responsibility for understanding what does that like common goal mean for exactly this team and how does like common goal like decomposes in like set of other goals and if you don't follow this lead so you you will never be able to like the build completely product, you will deal with like pieces and you will need to have like some massive team that actually trying to perform like the role of glue between those teams and you will need to manage this team as well and this team will have their own goals and like comp uh, like occasionally it will end apart, etc. So th th that's my kind of addition to, to setting like common goals or that's whatever. Cool. Yeah. yeah, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so. Cool. Um, yeah, I think it's a good discussion, and, and, part, and this is intentional, by the way, this, this group discussion, because what I really feel provides collaboration is just this, getting out and talking to people, hearing different perspectives. Um, it, it's something that everyone wants to do, and it, it's really easy to do. One of the things I used to do back in the day uh, when I worked with Trent, uh, 
who, uh, shout out to Trent Cameron, who helped or organize this, uh, by the way. Um, so, cool. Um, <laughs> everyone hates Trent. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I would go on walks with people a lot. Uh, I used to work downtown, um, and so my, my favorite thing to do is just go on walking meetings. Um, you know, part of it is to get out of the office. Part of it is to, I think, it, um, by getting out of the office and talking to people and understanding what they need, you have a better understanding of how you can help them, right? And this is, again, really simple. Uh, why don't we do this? Um, I don't know, but you should try it. <laughs> so I guess it may be on Zoom calls. I don't know how that works with walking, but... Uh, um, you know, and I'll give you an example too. Of, of I would say, you know, something that happened to me when I was working at the company at, at a company too, um, where I would think is the antithesis of collaboration. What really got me thinking about it in a deep sense was, um, you know, my, my team was tasked with doing task X, and all of a sudden, a uh, you know, a, a marketing VP decides one day, oh yeah, we're going to be going to a Gartner summit in two weeks, and we have to get this whole new functionality out that we have to demo, and it has to be somewhat live and stuff, and I'm like, this is insane, <laughs> right? So not just me, but almost the entire dev team ended up wanting to quit, and I think almost all of us almost did, um, by the saving grace of you know, the chief technology officer stepping in at the last second, um, we were saved, but it's after that happened. I didn't want to work with that marketing VP. I, I, I told him to go you know, F himself. Um, and um, you know, and that, that caused a lot of, I would say, um, toxic behavior um, and uh, walls to come up. Right, so, and, and ultimately that, that VP ended up leaving because uh, he, he couldn't get any traction with the dev team anymore or the data team. I, I'm sure you can understand why. If you're forcing a last minute request and saying this has to get done and this trumps every single sprint that you're working on, um, how would you feel about that, <laughs> right? So the natural reaction is we're just going to give you two giant middle fingers in the air and tell you to go politely on your way. And that's what we did. And so that, um, and it's really hard to break that trust uh, um, you know, it's really hard to get that back, I guess, after you've broken it, right? So, uh, that happens. It happened to me, and, um, you know, and, and since I saw that, you know, I mean, I, I realized what I did is I put up silos on my team after. I, I, I told a lot of execs, like, if you're going to come, you know, to my team, like, come talk to me first, right? This is, you know, but you get really defensive, so this is a very natural thing to do. I, I've seen it happen to myself, and in retrospect, maybe there, there probably would have been better ways to behave, but... Um, you know, defense mechanisms are, are simple because we're all, we're all people. That's, that's how it is. So, so wrapping up, you know, here's, here's some suggestions I would suggest for collaborating, um, you know, with your, uh, you know, your dev and data team. Uh, again, simple stuff. Consider your downstream and upstream stakeholders. Like, what do they want? Uh, you know, communicate regularly. Like I just said, go on, go on walks. Get to know the person, too. I think somebody here just said get to know people as people. I think that's, that's, a, that's a really big thing. Um, get to know what makes it, you know, the, Everyone tick. Everyone has their, their thing that they like and probably things they don't like. Get to, under, you know, get to know what they are. Um, you know, since this is DevOps, I would say, you know, this is a DevOps conference, I would say, you know, um, you know set up you know, common notification patterns, alerting and so forth for things that happen both upstream and downstream, right? I think that this is, um, especially for data, there, there's a notion of data ops. Who's heard of data ops, right? Barely anyone here. That's great. Um, so... <laughs> So data ops, uh, but what you're going to find is the data world is about 10 years behind where the dev world is. So they, they, it's like somebody just said, a find, in the data world, is that they could find and replace of all the cool terms in uh, dev. They're like, oh, dev ops will just like, find and replace uh, dev with data. And so you know, now you have data ops. You have uh, what's called data reliability engineers now. So <laughs> you think I'm joking. Go Google it. Um, but, and so what's interesting now is you're starting to see a whole suite of, of uh, you know, systems, um, ops systems in the data world now. And, you know, whether or not they talk to your systems or not, I think is uh, something you should look at. Because um, data teams are setting up um, their own monitoring, right? How much redundancy is there? You should go find out. Um, so... You know, it goes without saying, address root causes of problems. I mean, how many people, since I, I imagine people here work in ops, how many of you uh, focus on uh, addressing the, the root cause of the problems that you see? Some. I heard some, some uh, laughter as well. Um, so uh, I'll leave that to you to figure out. Um, and again, data is everybody's job. Like I said, the, the world is moving towards the data first, um, you know, data first applications, whether you like it or not. That's just, it is what it is. And so, you know, it's an inescapable force of gravity. Um, you know, get to know your data teams if you have one. And, um, yeah, 
With that, I will open up to questions. If you would like to uh, um, connect with me on LinkedIn, there's my QR code, you can scan it. And I'm gonna use the last 10 minutes for questions. Anyone have questions on this or any other topic related to data or life, uh, whatever? <laughs> Travel tips. Um. What's your opinion on product ops? Uh, which I haven't experienced, but I've, uh, you know, I've, I have a little bit of understanding of, and and where that would inter intersect with data ops. I'm not sure what what you mean by product ops. So pro product ops, as I understand it, would be, uh, you know, really instrumenting your how your, especially in the in, with digital uh, products, how your customers are are using. Uh, your products, mm. uh, and then uh, using that as a feedback loop, but it requires, uh, and it's and it's a somewhat controversial idea still, uh, but it's starting to to gain traction. Interesting. What's controversial about it? I'm not sure. Okay. I can speak to it. You can speak to it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So with the rise of product-led growth, meaning. Uh, you know, to contrast it with sales-led growth, where you've got salespeople going out and, and recruiting customers, product-led growth is the idea that you come, you sign up, you use it for free, uh, you uh, get uh, monetized, you, 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 you actually start paying for it. Um, it's all about the data. You know, what do people do in your application? How do they go mm, through that okay. funnel? And so it's very data-intensive. And so part of product ops is looking after, um, looking after some of these operational aspects of product management. You know, traditionally, product management is going out and meeting customers face to face. But when uh, product management then starts to take on some data intensive aspects, then it's more of an operational thing. Uh, there's other pieces uh, that product ops option uh, oper operationalizes as well. Uh, but uh, that's one big piece of it. That's cool. We'll have to talk after about product ops. I'm uh, you know, woefully ignorant of it. So um, I have friends, I, I suppose, that do operationalize the, the testing of products. Um, so uh, one of my friends, he, he, he used to be, uh, I think he was the first data scientist at Airbnb. So he has a new product. He has a new company called Epo. So they, they allow you to do A/B testing within your application to test different functionality um, of your of your um, of your product. And so is, would that be related to product ops? Maybe. So yeah. So again, it, yeah. It's uh, I, I have no opinion on it because I'm woefully ignorant and I uh, like don't like to have a um, um, poor opinions loosely held. So <laughs> um, other other questions. Uh, I'll let you take your pick. <laughs> so thinking more about the collaboration piece between data and dev, um, I, mean, I, I hear your points about having empathy, trying to create more of a human connection between the two facets. But in my, you know, as I think about trying to optimize, when you're presenting to your non-technical business units, they really only care about metrics. And so the metrics that they care about are performance. So how do you convert collaboration into something that can be measured? Like in your conversations, have you come up with anything that you know, when de data and dev work together, they can find a way of actually measuring what matters in that sense? Yeah, it typically doesn't work too well if the teams are siloed. I would say at that point, it's like you're, all, you're kind of on your own with your different, whatever your respective metrics or KPIs are. Um, I think it really comes down to understanding what the top level KPI is of maybe the company, and then trying to collectively drive that. That's the only way I've ever seen it work. But if the teams are siloed and they don't have any um, sort of aligned agenda or way of working together, I would say all bets are off at that point. There's no way it will work. So, um, uh, question here. You had your hand up first. The one in the black shirt with the sunglasses. <laughs> 
And then the one behind him had his hand up second, and the one over there had the hand up next. Thanks. Uh, what would you say the biggest benefit of the increased uh, focus on data engineering is for our our fields? Because we know, you know, the the way to get people excited about something is to show them the value. Right? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing really is um, if you go back to the 2010s. Uh, who, who knows what data science is? Who's heard of data science? Everybody sort of data science, great. So what happened was back in the day, and that's why I called myself a recovering data scientist, is people like myself um, who were super nerdy, super mathy, whatever, were hired to do data science. Um, what we typically find when we go to companies and do data science is there's either no data upon which to do the science, um, or there's no infrastructure supporting data, no practice supporting data, et cetera, right? So data engineering really came about to help address this problem. There's an old trope about data scientists, data scientists that they spend like 80% of their time getting data, cleaning it, you know, all this kind of stuff. That's really the job of a data engineer. And so I would say the data engineer provides the foundation for a data scientist to do their jobs. And in fact, I have another slide here, I think. Um, the data engineering life cycle, which is in my book, Fundamentals of Data Engineering. So what does a data engineer do? Um, we have about five minutes left. A data engineer basically, um, you know, as far as I could tell, is responsible for this, uh, this life cycle here of you know, getting data from source systems that generate data, you know, ingesting it, transforming it, and serving it all the way underneath it. You're storing it, right, and serving it then for analytics, machine learning, maybe reverse ETL, maybe a bunch of other use cases, you know, along with the associated undercurrents. And so that really is what data engineering, I would say, um, had evolved into. Before that, it was either a software engineer or a data scientist expected to do this job. So of course, um, you know, roles being what they are, they sort of just pop out of nowhere. And here's the data engineer. So hopefully that answers your question. So yeah. any other questions? Uh, you had your hand up, the one in the white hoodie. And then so I was going to ask you what you meant by recovering data scientists as well as what got you into data engineering, but I think you just can kind of answer yeah, that. Yeah, I was a data scientist and I'm in recovery right now. So <laughs> happens. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I uh, yeah. yeah there's a, actually, he had his question, he had his hand up in the back there first in the black jacket there. So sorry, I'll get to you next. Thanks for noticing me. Yeah. <laughs> so Joe, I have an um, interesting question for you. We have seen in last decade, uh, data has been gone from you know, where to where. We were talking about the XML, then uh, NoSQL, and then big data, blockchain, uh, machine learning. So what do you think in next uh, five years or 10 years, what is a big thing in data space world? Uh, well. Um, that's a good question. It depends. So short term, it's probably all the money is going into generative AI, like uh, um, you know any GPT-based company. I noticed one they had their do GPT with DevOps. Um, so that's one of them. Uh, you know, images, video, whatever. So I'm very curious what happens with generative AI and its impact on everything. Um, I'm also wondering how much of this is like reminiscent of the Web3 uh, bubble that just happened, because um, all the same investors and experts that were in Web3 are now in generative AI. So I don't know. Um, that's how these go. Um, so there's that. I would say what more importantly, what's happening is it's the rise of uh, streaming in real time. So in data over the last 10 years, the, the big elephant in the room had been the modern data stack. Who's heard of that? So who's heard of a data warehouse? Great. OK, I'll bring it back down to you. So data warehousing back in the day was um, basically a way to, you know, it was, it's a way of storing data for analytics. These used to be very expensive systems. It was cost you millions of dollars in a contract. Um, around 2012, um, you know, AWS announced Redshift, which then meant you can get a data warehouse in the cloud for 25 cents an hour. Um, and what this did is it changed the profile of how we use data, right? Data became very, da these systems became very easy to access. And all of a sudden you saw an explosion of data tooling, um, you know, and every, every possible application under the sun becoming a, you know, available to data practitioners, and this introduced what's called the modern data stack. What I see right now is the same thing that's happening with streaming, where Kafka, you know, Pulsar, uh, if you know these systems, these are streaming systems, um, these systems are, you know, they're relatively hard to manage if you try and manage them on your own. 
slightly easier to manage if you use a managed service. But what I see happening right now is, uh, you know, the same sort of plug and play, um, you know, abstractions are, are coming into the fold and, and streaming in a much major way. You're getting streaming pipelines, streaming databases. Um, Real-time machine learning is also a thing. Um, and so what I think is going to happen is, in, in my book, I call it the live data stack. So it's, it's actually shortening the feedback loop between application, machine learning, to the point where these, the, 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 the time, the feedback loop between these two things is going to be measured in milliseconds or nanoseconds, perhaps. That's what's happening. And so what happens over the next um, several years, I think, is um, the, the lines between software engineering, machine learning, data, are going to be incredibly blurry. You will not be able to know the difference between any of these. That's what I think is happening. I have time for one more question. Yes. Right there. Hold your hand up so people can. <laughs> You're being attacked by mics from both sides, by the way, so just be, get ready. Hey, hey, Joe, this is a great discussion. Um, curious kind of what your thoughts are with kind of this uh, feedback loop that almost kind of mirrors uh, like a neural network to get, get feedback on kind of the ETL side. Do you see a world where like the incremental changes in the database are kind of egressed out rather than this lift and shift of the entire data set from like an efficiencies perspective? Yeah, for sure. Are you talking about the source data set, the source databases? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right now what's happening is, um, you know, there's definitely, back in the day what you do is you basically like get a batch extract of a, from a source database and load that into your data warehouse, say. You know, just batch, rerun it, whatever. I'm sure you can see a lot of problems with this, by the way, because what happens if that's the data in the source database has been updated? And now you're using that for your analytics. There's ways around this, but they kind of suck. Um, so what's happening now is like change data capture. Who's familiar with that? Basically, it's taking the, uh, the, the deltas, and say if you're using Postgres, the write-ahead log, you, you can check the, um, you know, the changes that have happened in the database, and basically use that as a record under, to basically tell the data warehouse, OK, so these are the changes to this record. Um, whatever CRUD operations happened, um, and that, so that's, that's one aspect of it. The other thing are just pure event-driven systems, where it's like you're just bypassing the database entirely, and just events are being sent right into a um, you know, new streaming system. So my time's up. Uh, so, <laughs> but thank you, everybody. It's good to see you.